Hey everybody, welcome to CAF World War II, the show where we talk about World War II, aviation, history, and so much more. World War II is produced by the Commemorative Air Force, the world's largest flying museum. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and honor through flight and living history experiences. The CAF began the Warbird movement more than 65 years ago. And thanks to the support of individuals like you, we continue to grow strong. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And now our host, Steve Buss. Thanks for watching and keep them flying. Good evening and welcome to everyone watching tonight on Facebook, on YouTube, and those of you who are watching us on GoToMeeting. This is episode number 89 of Warbird 2. Tonight's episode will feature Ron King, producer of the documentary The Millionaire's Unit. That might be a familiar phrase to you because we talked to the author of the book The Millionaire's Unit, Mark Workman, several months ago. But this is the story behind the documentary that was inspired by the book. But before we get started with Ron, could you do us a favor? If you haven't already done so, please uh, like or take a second to share or subscribe and follow us. Now, if you are on YouTube and you do uh, subscribe, make sure you click on that bell icon. You'll get all the notifications about new episodes of Warbird 2. Now, as you watch this presentation, if you have any questions, just type them in the comments section of whatever social media platform you're on. We'll uh, try to answer them either during the presentation or before we sign off. And joining me, Right now is uh, Ron King, and uh, Ron, good to have you here with us this evening. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Steve. I really appreciate being here, and um, happy to happy to talk about uh, the Millionaire Unit. Yeah. Well, it, tell us a little bit about about you and and uh, your your life and and how you uh, came to be a producer and and involved in this in this production. Sure. Um, I mean, I've been in the business for quite a long time. I started out as an actor years ago when I was a kid and I uh, went to college for that and, um, you know, was a struggling actor for many years. But then circumstances fell out that um, after I took some time off from that to raise my family, basically, um, I got back into the business, but this time more behind the camera. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, in terms of this particular production, it's sort of an interesting story. Uh, I knew about the story of the Millionaire's Unit because we had a double volume uh, book that was published by the Davison family who were the originators of the Yale unit. Uh, but it was just sitting on the shelf and I really didn't know much about the details. I knew that my grandfather had flown in World War I, but it wasn't until uh, Mark Wortman's book came out that I really, got the full background on the story. And uh, so that's how I got involved in the in the project. Um, finding Mark's book was a complete happenstance. Uh, I was in a bookstore down here in Southern California and uh, there was a stack of new books I and I was drawn to it. I didn't know why I wandered over to it. And there on the cover of the book was a picture that included my grandfather. <laughs> and I went, wait a minute, I've never seen this picture before. I know that's my grandfather. And by the title of the book, I knew what the subject matter was. So you already knew the, the story of the millionaires unit before, uh, before the book came out, right? That was part of your family history. Correct. Yes. Um, I, I, again, I knew that my, my grandfather was a Naval aviator. He was Naval aviator number 73. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, but I didn't know the details of the story to any degree. So, uh, again, it wasn't until I, I actually got a hold of Mark's book and read it that, um, that uh, I really learned the details. And Mark is such an excellent writer that I felt like I was put into the story and I was standing there right next to my grandfather with all of his buddies while they were doing all these incredible things back in the early teens of the last century. So what was it like when you when you when you read the book? I mean, you, you said that you felt like you were back in, in that that portion of history, but that had to fill in a, a, a section of your family history that that you didn't know before. It, it did. And in fact, it, it came at a time when when I was at a point in my own life where I was wondering about, you know, who are my people? I want to mm -hmm. know more about my family members. And um, I think most people and their families have some idea of what their ancestors did. Um, but there also, I think, comes a time often in people's lives where they want to learn more about those, those ancestors. And these days we do it through all different means, of course. 
But in my case, uh, there was existent material. I just hadn't gotten into it until uh, a certain time in my life when I, I just really wanted to know, you know, who are my people? Where do I come from? <laughs> so well, that's how I got into it. Yeah, for those who may not have have been with us when Mark was talking about the book, just briefly give us a, a, the history of the of the Millionaires Unit, the, the Yale Flying Club that became the the beginnings of naval aviation. Yes, it's a it's an extraordinary story, of course, and I'll give you the nutshell version of how it all started. Um, back in 1914, the war began, World War One, that is, mm -hmm. and uh, our guys. Uh, who are featured in this story were just getting started at Yale University at that time. Um, and they heard about, uh, there's a great story of how Truby Davison first heard about the war. He was on a camping trip out in the mountains and, uh, and saw it in a newspaper on his, on his way home on a steamship. And he brought that story to all his friends. They were at Yale University. And he said, hey guys, um, this is going on we better get to it. And at that time in the country, there was what was called the preparedness movement. So there was uh, a certain uh, section of the U.S. population that was very much interested in supporting the allies and um, being ready if the call mm -hmm. came to take action. And I would say that my grandfather and his friends were definitely uh, part of that preparedness group. They wanted to be ready to fly. They wanted to be ready to serve if the, if the notice came to do so. Um, but because they were at Yale and because of Truby Davison's position, his father's position in, uh, in uh, the financial world, he had an entree to make the idea of the Yale unit um, get attention at the government level. And so he did, and they uh, began their, their flight training, uh, not unconventionally, not in a uh, land-based airplane, but uh, uh, seaplanes. Correct. Um, yeah, he, uh, Ruby was an incredible leader. He, he had a vision. He knew that um, if the U.S. got involved in the war, he wanted to be in it in aviation. And his family was of such means that they could take over a small flying school not far from his home. And they actually invited, he invited all of his friends to come and stay for the summer at the Davison Estate and then take the little car ride over to uh, Port Washington to learn how to fly. And you're right, it was, uh, it happened to be just by chance a Curtis uh, flying school uh, with one instructor <laughs> and uh, Dave McCullough, his name was, and he taught these guys how to fly the aircraft. Um, but they were, he was very big on safety. He wanted to make sure they were safe. So he taught them how to break down the aircraft and put it all back together again before they could even uh, really learn to fly. He was quite a character himself uh, <laughs> as yeah. the instructor, but but again, as, as you mentioned, uh, safety was was paramount and um, he, wanted, he wanted his students to know their airplane inside and out, and as you say, be able to take it apart and put it back together, which in those days was more important than it is today because there just weren't a whole lot of airplane mechanics around. So you, if you were going to fly it, you had to make sure you knew how to fix it if something broke. And, things broke quite often. Yeah, that's so true. <laughs> well, and, and one of the other interesting uh, ties, I mean, your grandfather uh, being a part of this unit has your family tie, but Bruce Dern, who narrates the documentary, he has a, a relative uh, connection as well. And we, we see the, the gentleman here on the right. That is true. His uh, Bruce Dern, who was mm -hmm. so kind uh, to come forward and narrate the documentary for us, his great uncle was Kenneth McLeish, who was one of the Yale unit members, uh, whose older brother was Archibald McLeish, also a Yaley, who of course went on to become a very famous poet and, and playwright. Uh, Kenny was, was struggling kind of to get his own uh, place going in the Yale unit and find his way. His story is an amazing story, it's a beautiful story. But um, yeah, when, when we worked with Bruce, he said, hey guys, come here, I wanna show you something. He took out his phone and he went through his phone until he found the picture of the house uh, in Illinois, I believe it was Illinois, where he um, grew up. And it turned out to be the same house where Kenny McLeish had lived. Uh, 
many years before. So there was a, a very direct connection. Bruce was very much aware of the story and was really happy to be a part of it. How did you how did you come across Bruce as as your your narrator? Was that because of this tie, or was that something that just sort of happened later? Um, well, we we found out that that his okay. Bruce's middle name is in Kalish, so <laughs> so we we found out the connection, and uh, we invited him to come to a screening of the film uh, prior to the final mix and and the sound mix. He loved it. Um, he said, hey, isn't this thing uh, going to be in the Academy Awards or something? <laughs> we said, oh, we don't know about that. We're not there yet, Bruce. But um, then he got involved after that. So, okay. um, yeah, he was a great supporter of the film. Got one more uh, shot of the, uh, of the boys down in Palm Beach before uh, shipping oh, yeah. out. That's right. So they started, as I said, up in Port Washington mm -hmm. near the Davison Estate, learning to fly with Dave McCullough. And then um, as the weather got cold up in uh, the part of Long Island where their training base was, they actually moved down to Palm Beach. Now they didn't move down there in any normal fashion. They, they actually were, went down there on J.P. Morgan's train. <laughs> his <laughs> private train and they actually my grandfather was actually in charge of breaking down the airplanes and putting them on the on the train and then making sure they were all reassembled when they got to the other end so um so yeah it was uh it was <laughs> kind of an extraordinary situation they actually went into one of the huge hotels down there in west palm beach um where they started and then they moved to a smaller hotel where again they took over the entire mm -hmm. hotel for the Yale unit and uh, trained there. And that, that's a shot of them down there, I believe, um, on one of the uh, uh, one of the one of the docks. And they had several where they would uh, pull out the Curtis F Model F flying boats. And in this is period of history, those who were of uh, financial means. Uh, like Truby Davison, uh, who who led this effort, uh, there there really was a feeling of um, sort of if, if something happens, we're going to be the ones who need to go first because we've been privileged and we're part of this country, but we also want to do our part to uh, to support the war effort if if it comes and it, as it very well did. Indeed, they had a sense of duty. They mm -hmm. had a sense of uh, patriotism for sure. Um, and they did feel that it was their, you know, personal responsibility to do something uh, when the country needed them. Uh, to give you an example of that, prior to my grandfather's involvement with the Yale unit, there was the conflict in Mexico that you probably know about, uh, Pancho Villa, and that was actually the first time that airplanes were ever used by the U.S. in combat was in that conflict. And my grandfather was hot and ready to go, and he wrote a letter to his father and said, "Hey, I want to get, I want to get down there. I want to help these guys." And his fa his father said, "Hold up, wait a minute. <laughs> this may not be the conflict you want to get involved with." And then it wasn't, but a few months later that he got involved with the Yale unit. So yes, they all felt um, that it was their duty to help the country when needed. Yeah. Let's talk about the the production itself now. The documentary took uh, about seven years from uh, start to finish. Yes, it's a, a a project of love, isn't it? It is a it is a passion project for sure. Um, uh, my colleague and friend Derek Greer, who is my co-director on the film, uh, was a longtime documentary filmmaker, and uh, I knew that he had done that. One day, I went over to his house, and there were photographs and illustrations from a bygone era on his walls. And I said, yeah, this is the guy that I want to work with on this because he loves history so much. But uh, yes, it, uh, we started from that. We started from the idea, hey, uh, what do you think about trying to make a, a documentary about this story? And we both agreed that it was a good idea. Derek read Mark's book as well. And, um, and that was how we got started, the, literally from an idea. We had nothing to begin with. And that's why it took us all those years to uh, to get the film made because 
the way we did it is we would appeal to people in little fundraising events that we would have and get a little bit of money from those events and then make a little bit of the movie and then do that over and over and over again over the course of those years. And I should say that early on, I was invited by Mark Wortman to sit on a panel that he had at the Yale Club in New York. And the Davison family was part of that uh, event, as were members of the Ingalls family. And it turned out that two other, well, there were several other grand sons and daughters who became involved in the production over the years, including uh, Harry Davison, who is Tribute Davison's grandson, and Mike Davison, who is both Truby Davison and David Ingalls uh, grandson, and they both came on as producers. So they really helped us uh, over the years with these fundraising events and uh, be able to put the, the uh, capital together we needed to, to make the movie. So you had mentioned that you were an actor. You got sort of behind the behind the camera and started uh, working that way. Is was this the the first major project that that you had or did you have some experience to build on before that? Well, I personally, this was my first feature okay. film of any kind, whether it be a documentary or a narrative. As I mentioned, Derek Greer, my, my mm -hmm. co-director, who also produced the film with me, uh, had a long experience in documentary production. So luckily, one of us knew what they were doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're looking at some uh, some pictures of uh, World War Two or World War One aircraft um, in uh, New Zealand. And how did you get hooked up with with that with that group? You know uh, what we learned fairly quickly after diving into this subject and trying to figure out how are we going to illustrate this incredible story, mm -hmm. particularly over a period of two hours. I mean, there's so much archival footage that exists, which in the case of World War One aviation and naval aviation is pretty minimal. Mm -hmm. um, it's there, but it's minimal. So we learned very quickly that there are very few people in the world who operate these types of aircraft. Um, and um, we learned that one of these uh, groups was um, uh, the group over in, in New Zealand, uh, Vintage Aviator Limited. And Peter Jackson is the owner of that, the filmmaker Peter Jackson, and he was amenable to having us come over and shoot with his aircraft. Uh, we spoke to the person who was managing his, his uh, essentially an air force of World War I airplanes that he is, he's a, you know, passionate about World War I airplanes and the whole um, uh, craft of, of making them, and he, he crafts them basically almost from scratch. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, yes, so we literally called them up and said, hey, we're a couple of filmmakers in, in the United States. We're interested in possibly working with your aircraft. Would that be a possibility? And, and the answer was, sure, if you can get over here. And <laughs> <laughs> so we said, OK, well, we're going to work on that. And that, that was, again, one of our fundraising uh, tasks was specifically to go over to New Zealand and shoot with um, shoot with uh, Mr. Jackson's aircraft. Yeah. Well, and in the documentary, the aircraft really become uh, like the characters, the, the, the real life characters of the, of the flying club, the, the airplanes themselves become uh, stars of the show. And, but it, over the seven year period, that's, that's a, a long time. Um, and you've got different footage from different eras, uh, different technologies. Uh, this, the picture we're looking at is, is got uh, from a GoPro camera, which is something that we didn't have 10 years ago. Um, it, well, a little longer than that, but um, how did you manage to get everything to look like it was one continuous uh, uh, shot? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. How, how, does, how does everything go together? Yeah. And I mean, that's part of the, part of the process in terms of when you get closer to the end. So we started with a script. We actually right. did have a script written. So we knew all of the things that we wanted to have in the story. That, of course, got refined over those seven years. And then we were capturing footage from all different sources uh, over the seven years, combining that with the archival footage. So it's really not until you get closer to the end of the process when you start to get all that stuff in the edit bay. And uh, we 
we did many, many edits and we worked with a couple of different editors over, I would say a period of about, about two to three years really, um, as we got more and more of the film uh, ready for completion. So it was it was a lengthy process, and we had a lot of reviews uh, with our our brain trust in our nonprofit uh, to make sure that we were going down the right way with with uh, the way of telling the story. But uh, yes, it's um, the footage. Some of the footage we got is just completely amazing. We we were able over in New Zealand. We worked with um, uh, John, John Coyle, who who was the inventor of this incredible gimbal called the shot over. So we got these air to air shots that are just rock steady in terms of the, the picture uh, of the Sopwith Camel and a lot of the Fokker aircraft uh, flying over New Zealand. It, and it was just, you know, unbelievable when we saw this footage and it was so much fun to do. Indeed. Uh, and this is uh, one of the, the oh. camera mounts that you're, you're talking about. There it is. So you can see the you can see the shot over on the front of the nose of the helicopter there. I love the uh, the name of the hangar there, Dairy Air Limited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that airfield in Masterton, um, which is where we were filming. Uh, yeah, that was a funny thing. But they have a really beautiful grass airfield there, um, where the aircraft would would take off from and land. Um, I was the ground cameraman. I'm, I'm credited as the DP, uh, director of photography on the movie as well, but I did not shoot everything. We had a lot of different actual camera operators, but in, in this shoot here, I was the ground camera operator. So I was out in the middle of that big grass field while the airplanes were doing their flybys. And um, like that shot you saw of the camel coming right at me, that was me filming. And the pilot took the camera just a couple of feet over my head um, and I had to, you know, completely trust what was <laughs> happening there. Uh, but uh, he was a great pilot, so that worked out really well. But yeah, this is the crew, and they were fantastic. There's, uh, there's my colleague Derek giving some direction uh, to the camera operators and pilots uh, about how we wanted to shoot um, the scene. So we did pre-plan our shots, mm -hmm. um, but of course, when you get up there, we didn't have radio communication between the pilots, uh, so we had to pre-plan it on the ground and then go up and shoot it uh, according to what our plan was. Did you did you do storyboards for each of the, the sequences so that everyone yeah, knew we what, did, we what did was pre, going on? we did pre-storyboard it, and we had those storyboards. That's what Derek's holding in his hand. He's got some, some of the storyboards there, so we're going over, over how to do it. And then the pilots and camera people are trying to figure out, okay, if we're going to do it that way, where? <laughs> that's why all their hands are doing this. It's like, yeah. oh, I'm going to go this way. You're going to go that way. I'm going to go this way. So you work it out beforehand. That is a that is a typical pilot shot. There, I don't I don't think pilots can talk without without using their hands. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then here we see the uh, the result of that with the uh, the helicopter uh, chasing the two airplanes. Yeah, those are two. I believe SE five A's, the uh, the British aircraft, um, which were in great flying shape. We we wanted to have a pair of aircraft flying together like that because. There's a sequence in the film where we talk about um, Kenny McLeish and David Ingalls, who were two of the best pilots in the unit. Ingalls having scored five victories in World War I and the only naval ace of World War I. Um, and the two of them were, were great buddies and, uh, and rivals to an extent in the, in, the, in the air. And so this was our effort to show that part of the story. Well, uh, speaking of uh, Mr. Ingalls, We've got a uh, we've got a clip here from the uh, from the the documentary itself, and we'll take a look at that and uh, learn a little bit more and, and take a look at some of the uh, fantastic photography that uh, came uh, through this. It is a very aggressive airplane, a huge amount of power. Contact. The difficulty was the engine. The whole engine spins with the propeller. You have a tremendous amount of gyroscopic force, which means that that rotating mass forces the airplane to dive when you're turning to the right and climb when you're turning to the left because of that rotating mass. 
It is an airplane that sort of has a mind of its own until you coordinate with the airplane and then it, it becomes part of you and you become part of the airplane. They wrote home to their parents describing the antics they engaged in in these aircraft, uh, fighting each other in, in mock battles. They also carried out an activity they called bush bouncing, which was to take your airplane down to about 25 or 50 feet off the ground, race at full speed, approach a house, a tree, a herd of cows, a farmer, and then jump up in the air over him and then come right back down to earth. They absolutely were in love with this machine. The Hamel, I think, probably was more or less the same as all other fighters at that time, excepting that it was the, the slowest of the better fighters and without doubt the most maneuverable of the fighters that the Allies had. It, uh, as I recall, landed perhaps uh, 45 or 50 miles an hour with a top speed of about 120 miles. Of course, most people know it got its name for that hump over the guns, and it's a camel. But that area is where all the weight is concentrated. The pilot, fuel tank, guns, and engine are all very compact. It makes it quite maneuverable. A byproduct of that is that it, the airplane gets extremely difficult to fly, especially for a novice when the airplane is trying to divert from what you want it to do. All that instability, you use it for your own benefit, and then you become invincible in the sky. Uh, Dave Ingalls, at one point, takes it up and forces it into a spin, something, of course, they were warned not to do. He then corkscrewed practically to the ground, pulled out, went up, and did it again and did it over and over and over, and then wrote home about how sick to his stomach he was for the next several hours. Some fantastic footage there uh, in, the, uh, in the documentary, and um, I think it's kind of funny that uh, Ingalls had uh, uh, just spun himself, <laughs> spun himself sick, as it were. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, he was a real good, yeah, he was a go-getter in the air. They called him the baby daredevil at one point. I mean, he was he would just go for it and uh yeah, <laughs> he was he was a fantastic pilot. But they they were on the cutting edge. I mean, there were there were so many things that were unknown about aviation at the time and the warning to not spin the airplane was easier than trying to figure out how to recover from a spin, I I suppose, and he he figured it out pretty pretty uh dramatically, I, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. There was one of their one of their guys um, who uh, was training with David Ingalls and Ken McLeish up in Gosport, England, where they had a the British had a special flying school set up there. Well, this guy, his last name was Smith. He got his something of his um, his his leather uniform caught in the stick of the aircraft and just was looping and he couldn't he couldn't get out of it and eventually he did but yeah so things like that would happen and uh they they had to figure out how to <laughs> how to how to recover from those without the training to do so yeah right so the uh, the pilots who flew the airplanes were they all from uh peter jackson's uh museum the pilots that we worked with in New Zealand were, yes, but okay. we also filmed in uh, New York State at the old Rhinebeck Aerodrome, mm -hmm. uh, and they have pilots, their own pilots there as well. Right. So we worked with a number of pilots, but um, yes, the ones, uh, the ones that were in New Zealand were all associated with uh, vintage aircraft. Yeah. Well, and, and speaking of uh, filming here at, at the States, uh, the... Uh, Glenn Curtis Museum and the flying boat there. That's uh, is an awesome looking looking contraption. <laughs> now you said this yes, is a, we, actually a, a reproduction of the the uh, Model E. Correct. It is uh, it is a reproduction. However, the motor is a genuine Curtis uh, OX eight, 
modal, motor uh, historians, you'll correct me on that, I know. <laughs> but uh, the, um, yeah, the Curtis, this is a Model E, and uh, that was a fantastic experience. We heard that they were going to be flying that aircraft about a year before they actually did so. And we coordinated with them because they had one day where they did a test flight. And then they had a second day where they, they did, it was part of a fly-in where they had a, mm -hmm. a lot of aircraft there. So we asked them if it would be okay if we came up during their test flight to film. And they said, that's fine. Again, if you can get here. <laughs> yeah. so, so we were able to get there and we were able to uh, film with the aircraft. I was uh, filming that from a speedboat on the water uh, with a little stabilizer on the camera as the, as the aircraft was taking off and landing on the water. And then we also put a camera on the pilot um, to get a point of view shot, what it looked like flying the aircraft. And uh, that was pretty fantastic. Although uh, we didn't, we weren't able to actually review that footage until much later in the day. So we didn't know if we had gotten anything. And then we, we found out that we did and we were super excited about that. Almost the same as the in in film days, right? Where you uh, you filmed whatever shots you had, <laughs> you did the daily rushes to see what you what you actually had in the camera. Yeah, yeah. So some things don't really change with the uh, with the movie making, <laughs> do they? Right, <laughs> they stay the same. How uh, you mentioned the stabilized camera uh, in the years that that uh, this took place. What are some of the other technology advancements that, that helped move the uh, documentary forward, if there were any? Uh, in terms of filmmaking? Yes. Well, I mean, the great thing about the tools that we have today is the digital platform, because once you have uh, your material recorded, then you can quickly get it into a system and begin editing it right away, which is really advantageous. I remember one time, it was after the, the Rhinebeck, New York shoot, uh, we had shot it in the, mor in the morning or the previous day. The next day, we were down at Peacock Point um, at an event at the Davison Estate, and I remember that morning I was editing uh, furiously to get our you know little clips together of what we had shot the day before to show people, here's what we're up to. You know, so in that in that regard, um, the digital tools that we have today are just a, a huge advantage of the old days when you had to chemically process your film, <laughs> wait, see what the lab does, get your reports back, and then start looking at it. So the instantaneousness is really a huge advantage these days. I've got a, uh, a picture of uh, Derek here uh, again, and. Uh, it he was a, a part of that. Uh, there was another gentleman who was uh, helped out with this as well. Is that correct? Or uh, in this particular case, you may be thinking of another film. This particular film, okay. uh, Derek and I were the co-directors, okay. um, and of course, we worked with a lot of other people, and we had the support of the nonprofit that we put together to make the movie. But um, yeah, Derek and I really um, split the responsibilities of making the film and. There were some shoots that I went on solo where we were so shoestring in terms of our, our budget that uh, I ended up doing a few shoots completely on my own where I set up all the lights myself, I did all the audio myself, I interviewed the subject. Um, and then Derek also did solo work overseas. He went over to, um, to Europe to get uh, film some locations uh, that were uh, from the actual time period of the of the events themselves, we wanted to have that footage. And Derek went over there and got that completely on his own, in some cases, having only one chance to get it. Right. Um, there's one point where there's a big uh, battle that takes place over the mole in Belgium. And Derek was on a ferry that, a commercial ferry that just happened to go past this lighthouse that was on the end of the mole. And he had one chance to get that on camera, and he did a beautiful job of it. It came out really well for the movie. So, you know, there were cir circumstances like that where we really only had one chance to get these things, like with the Curtis, uh, the Model E flying mm -hmm. boat and other other shots like that. So uh, one of our uh, viewers is asking, uh, is there sound from the uh, the Curtis E uh, flying boat that's uh, part, of the, part of the film? As a matter of fact, there is. Um, 
with the Curtis Model E, uh, they, before they actually flew the aircraft, they had it on land, and of course they want to warm up that motor before they actually send it out there. The, the, the mechanics want to make sure that the motor's running perfectly. I took the advantage of that moment to throw on my headphones and get my uh, boom pole out, the microphone on it, and I spent a lot of time recording that motor. <laughs> so the, uh, the sounds that you'll hear for that particular uh, motor are in the documentary. Um, we didn't substitute sounds. Uh, in fact, okay. the Camel and the rotary aircraft engines, we wanted to get the sound of those accurate as well. And uh, they have a very, very specific sound. As you probably know, mm -hmm. when they when they come in for a landing, when they want to slow down the aircraft, they actually turn off the motor with a blip switch. Um, that's how they slowed down the aircraft, yeah. and uh, we have that on on we recorded that on on mic as well. So we have in examples of that as well. I, I I thought I heard that when we were watching that that video clip when the airplane was coming coming down. You hear that the interrupt in, in yeah, like, you hear, oh, that's right, that's burp, right. Burp. Yep. It's like kind of burping. Yeah. yeah. So it's uh, again the uh, the technology of the day was uh, different than what we have today. That's for, that's for sure. So with with uh, you and Derek uh, sharing the the co-producer roles, how did you decide who was going to take care of what? I mean, obviously you had have had a very good relationship, uh, personal relationship to start with, but professionally, how did you decide which who was going to do what? Yes, well again, with Derek's experience having done several documentaries before this, and also with his writing skill, he was really put in charge of the script and the overall story. So we worked on that together over all those years, but it was Derek's job to make sure that, um, that the script was the way we wanted it. And um, you know, he had to pour through, oh, just mountains of archival material, transcriptions, of all the interviews that we did, pick out the best sound bites. I mean, we might interview somebody for over a course of an hour, and out of that entire interview, we might only use a few seconds, a right. couple of words here or there from the subject we were interviewing. So it was Derek's uh, difficult task, I would say, to sort through all that and piece together something that made sense <laughs> uh, with an overall story arc that we wanted to tell. You mentioned research, and in, in our conversation the other day, you, you said uh, that you had uh, letters from your grandfather that put a different, uh, not a different spin, but a, you, a different perspective than what Mark had in his book, because Mark didn't have uh, access to those those letters when, when he was writing the book. And how did, how did you incorporate that into the, into the documentary? I mean, that's a, that's a great example of having a ton of, of research material and only using a very tiny portion of it. For me, it was uh, incredibly lucky that my aunt had saved those letters, first of all, have to credit her for that. Uh, secondly, she gave me access to come and read them. I ended up scanning all those letters. There were about 200 letters from 1915 through 1919. So, of course, back in those days, no, no internet, obviously. <laughs> Uh, maybe not so obviously for some people, but it, there was no internet, uh, and the way that people communicated was through uh, through letter writing. Yeah. And all these guys were, you know, classically trained in terms of their writing skills, so they were all very good at uh, writing descriptions of what they were going through. So for me, it was just fascinating to read these 200 letters that my grandfather had written. I actually transcribed all of them. Uh, that hasn't been published as a, as a book or anything, but I did transcribe all those letters. Um, and he was also, my grandfather was also uh, an artist, so he drew little drawings of things that had happened uh, over that period of time. Um, and there were things that happened that people really don't, aren't aware of that aren't in our documentary, like mm -hmm. um, uh, Quentin Roosevelt was a friend of the Davison family. And he actually came over to Peacock Point when the Yale Yuma was forming to check them out to see, hey, are these the guys that I want to maybe go with? Of course, he was not a Yaley, so <laughs> that, that, that was a little bit against it. But there's a really funny little drawing that my grandfather made where he was wrestling with Quentin Roosevelt. And he said, Here, here's Quentin has me in a scissor grip. And there's a picture of, of Quentin Roosevelt with his legs over my grandfather, and they were in a wrestling match. 
Um, <laughs> so yeah, little little things like that that um, are not well known that happened uh, that you pick up from reading letters like that. Sure. And, and this is way off topic, and and I'm I'm not sure there was not the censorship. Uh, of letters back home in World War One that we saw in World War Two and 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 beyond, so they could pretty much express whatever they were th- whatever was on their mind, for the most part. Almost there Almost. there was some censorship, mm-hmm. yes, by the U.S. government. The reason I say that is because my grandfather, who had a great sense of humor as well, he was he would say things like, "And what I can't tell you about <laughs> is, <laughs> or the subject that I really can't mention is, <laughs> or whatever." Um, but he, not that he would try to tell, uh, you know, anything with any sort of confidential information, but he would allude to the fact that he couldn't talk specifically about certain subject matter, uh, due to the censor. So there was, sure. there was censorship. They did check out the letters that were coming in to make sure that, uh, that it wasn't violating any of their, uh, of their, uh, you know, uh, security concerns. Okay. Well, good. The, the picture we're looking at here, uh, proves that, uh, filmmaking documentary, uh, production, it takes place in in all different uh, <laughs> locations and weather conditions. Um, yeah, you guys are on the Yale campus in the snow. In the snow, we were. It was a privilege to be filming on the Yale campus, where so many of the events of the story take place. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, particularly in the early part of the story, when the the boys are all still at Yale and they're forming the unit and they're having their their meetings um, and they're bringing in people like William Thaw. To talk to them. William Thaw was uh, flew with the Lafayette Escadrille, which was another mm-hmm. outfit be- prior to the Yale unit, um, a very famous uh, group, and he actually came back and talked to them about his experience. Uh, and, you know, we also filmed inside the chapel at Yale, where the boys were required at that time, this is 1916, they were required to go to chapel service, mm-hmm. I think, every day before classes. Um, so, so it was really, really a wonderful experience to be on, on the Yale campus. Plus Yale has an incredible archive yep. and the Truby Davison papers are at Yale university. So, uh, both Derek and I did research with the, with Truby's papers there, uh, which include, include not just, um, you know, written material, but also a, a boatload of photographs that we were able to use, uh, in the documentary as well. What was the the favorite location that that you ended up on uh, for the for the film? Wow, that's that's a tough question because <laughs> it did take us around the world, literally. Right. Um, you know, for me, the time in New Zealand was a, a particularly uh, memorable time, uh, mostly because it was it was just we were so into these aircraft um, that they had there. Uh, the the these. These, these these machines are just beautifully made. And, um, you know, to have these pilots who would just jump into an airplane and just go and start flying. I remember the first day that we got there, the rain was coming in. I mean, it was like raining intermittently. It was the sun was going down. We're like, are we going to actually do something right now? And they're like, yeah, let's do it. Let's get up there. We're like, okay. So we had our cameraman. Uh, he got into a into a really a, a warm overall suit, and they put him in a in a in a like a Cessna with the door off, and you know strapped in. And he had this stabilizing unit on the camera, and the stop with camel took off. The Cessna took off. They went out flying over the landscape and got what turns out to be the final image in the documentary of this beautiful shot of the camel flying across the sunset um, was filmed on that very first day that we were there. So it was <laughs> filled with all sorts of magical moments like that. Is that is that the same shot that we saw a little earlier in the presentation, the, the still? Probably, yeah. If there's one with a camel with the, uh, with this, that one. Yeah, that, one? that was yeah. day one. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was literally raining like uh, half an hour before that. And they said, no, we're going up anyway. <laughs> They That's amazing. So, yeah. What uh, what historic movies inspire you? Well, that's a that's a great question because I you know I love documentaries, I love uh, history, but uh, you know I have to say that when I was a young kid um, in the 1960s, uh, when the Blue Max came out, 
and uh, I saw it on its first release. This is in a very small little theater, and I was pro I had to have been six or seven years old at the time, but uh, I went with my dad, who really was a big influencer uh, for me in terms of filmmaking, because he always took me to the movies, and you know, saw the Blue Max and was completely blown away by it. Um, so I love that movie in the history. Uh, another one that my dad took me to later, which was a huge influence, was uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, which I saw in 1968 in San Francisco on a CinemaScope screen when I was 10 years old. You know, and experiences like that just get lodged in your brain forever. And, um, you know, you, you, you draw on those when you go make your own films. So those were a couple of the inspirations. Was was filmmaking, acting, filmmaking, always uh, a part of the plan, or or at one point were you going to be a, a civil engineer or so, or something like that, or was <laughs> the, the filmmaking just sort of with you all all through your life? Well, that's a great question because honestly, the vision was very short sighted. <laughs> I <laughs> thought I was going to be an actor, <laughs> and then I encountered what it actually means to try to pursue an acting career, mm -hmm. <laughs> which. Uh, thousands and thousands of actors around the world understand. Um, but, um, yeah, so I, you know, in terms of film, I was just always, uh, always moved by film. So at, I also, part of my creative process is I was always interested in making films. So I started making them in my college years, and shortly thereafter, I pretty much always had a camera. I did still photography before that. So I was familiar with the camera, what it could do. And then as I moved into motion picture, um, uh, that just stuck with me. So uh, no, I did not aspire to be a civil engineer, but uh, I did have a long career in the technology field as well, um, helping people to uh, learn how to use technology. That was my job. I was sort of the, uh, the, the in-house guru, as it were, for different software applications. But throughout that entire period, I was always doing something with, with film or with video. So my skills were increasing uh, little by little over the, over, the, over the years. There you go. Um, and one of our uh, viewers has, has a question. We might be getting a little deep uh, with your experience, but we'll, we'll give it a shot anyway. Do you have any idea where they uh, found the rotary engine uh, for, those, uh, for those aircraft in New Zealand? Great question. Uh, I don't know the answer, but what I do know is that, as I said earlier in the program, there are very, very few people around the world who work with these aircraft, mm -hmm. um, who build them, who restore them, who make these uh, replica aircraft. And I would say that the, the, you know, the top people in those organizations, what we came to learn was that they kind of all know each other. So even if they're rivals in some, some mm -hmm. respect, they kind of know each other. And hence, they know uh, through their own grapevine where the parts are, you know, where these motors might be, what, you know, museum might have a part that they're looking for or, or uh, the motor they're looking for. One of the gentlemen who you saw in the video clip is Javier Arango. He's not titled in the, in the little uh, piece there, but he was interviewed. Javier, uh, unfortunately, is no longer with us, but he was a, a world-renowned collector of these aircraft. And I remember being at his uh, facility at one point, and he had about, he had about uh, 10 or 12 of those motors by themselves. And I took lots of pictures of them in his hangar. Um, some were rotary, some were not. But, um, yeah, so they, they all knew each other. They knew where the parts were. I don't, but they do. <laughs> What about in a follow up to that is what about maintenance when you went out and did a, a photo shoot or whatever? Was there a great deal of maintenance that had to go into the aircraft after they came back? Oh, I mean, those those aircraft are being meticulously maintained at all times, I think. Particularly, I mean, for these aerodromes like the one in New Zealand and like Rhinebeck and Javier's own private aerodrome, you know, the the they have. Uh, not, you know, not a ton of mechanics, but the aircraft are just loved to death. I mean, they just take care of those things so well. So um, like back in my grandfather's day when their instructor insisted 
that they learn how to break down the aircraft and put it back together again and learn some of the basic mechanics also um, of these aircraft. It's the same thing. So these, these, these mechanics are just, you know, very diligent in knowing every little aspect of them and taking very, very good care of them when they came down. One thing I wanted to mention that was experiential uh, from that shot where he flew over me with that Sopwith Camel. Uh, as some of your viewers may know, those engines have castor oil in them. And as, they, <laughs> as that engine spins around, the castor oil gets sprayed. So when he flew over me, it was like shower of castor oil. And I was like, <laughs> okay, that's what castor oil smells like. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it... Uh, it happens. <laughs> How long did it take you to clean up the uh, the camera after that? <laughs> uh, you know, I don't recall exactly, but I'm sure I went through a few different uh, lens cleaners on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. So, it, with uh, if someone wants to see the documentary, how how can they how can they get a hold of it? Yes, uh, for Amazon Prime members, it is free to view on Amazon for Prime members. Um, we also have it streaming on Apple and, um, and some of the other streaming platforms. The, not, it's not on Netflix, but it is on Amazon. Um, so you can see it there. Also, if you're really, really into the subject and you want to know even more about it, uh, we also produced a DVD that includes five additional films. So it's got a making of the documentary in there. And it also has a couple of other films on uh, naval aviation stories that we learned while we were making the film, but just weren't able to make the cut into the two hour cut or else it would have been more like a three or four hour movie. You know, it's not not hard to do when you're dealing with that much uh, uh, archival material and research. Oh, yeah. And an absolutely fascinating story, uh, you know, because the Yale Flying Club is influential in naval aviation from the very beginning up through the, the 1960s there there is some of the members are still part of the uh, part of naval aviation through its uh, almost its entire history it's uh, it's a fascinating story if you've not read the book go get the book read mark and uh, for you Ron what is uh, what is next on your horizon well uh, I've got a number of projects that are in development right now um, uh, a couple of feature films I'm currently editing a music video that I shot and directed. Um, and also we're developing a, uh, what we hope will be a narrative version of the Millionaire's Unit story. I'm actually working with Mark Workman on that. We're collaborating on the script. And um, we have uh, been talking to people around town here uh, to see if we can raise some interest for it. It's a, it's a tough, tough job to do. Uh, but uh, Mark loves the story. I love the story. We've encountered encountered uh, you know a number of people who love the story, and we feel that if we can get it to the right people, uh, there's a chance that we can actually get it made. Um, but as you know, in in Hollywood, uh, you know there are many tales of projects that. Uh, well, it took seven years to make the documentary, so we'll see how long it takes to make the uh, <laughs> the series. <laughs> so this would be a, a, a limited run series of maybe eight episodes or something telling the telling the story. That's what we feel. Again, okay. the, the story is so big. I mean, when you read Mark's book, you'll understand that there is so much to to tell, so many different stories to tell. Mm -hmm. Honestly, that it could be a one season affair, it could be a three season affair. Sure. So it's just a matter of uh, uh, how it all comes together in the end. So what's the what's the biggest challenge uh, for for making a docu drama uh, as it as it were? Um, thinking about the the script, what's the biggest challenge that you you're looking at? Sure. Um, well, I think one of the one of the challenges today in these current times may be that um, these guys who, as I said earlier in the in the show you know, really felt it was incumbent upon them to do something for their country. They, they were really dedicated to this uh, idea of helping and uh, providing with, with the country's defense and other countries who we were allied with in World War I. Um, these days, I think sometimes groups of young white men are viewed slightly differently, <laughs> particularly ones from, uh, from the elite universities. So that could be a, a, 
a, a drawback for some people. Although I have to say that in, in the case of these guys, that was actually their strong suit and what kind of makes it unique because they had the resources to put together their own flying school to get themselves ready. So at the time that the Navy finally said, you know what, we actually do need you guys after originally rejecting them saying, hey, you guys are very patriotic guys, but we don't really need you. Uh, then they eventually said, actually, nobody else really knows about this stuff. So can you guys come in and work for us? And they said, we're there. So, um, so I think it's a, a really worthy story to tell these days. Great. Well, before we sign off, any, uh, any final thoughts tonight? No, I mean, I just hope people who are interested in this have a chance to both look at the documentary and Mark's book. Um, you know, Mark's book uh, was a huge inspiration for Derek and myself making the documentary. And the book, as with many book to movie translations, is going to have a lot more information in it than our documentary does. There's only so much that you can tell in a two hour period. Whereas with Mark's book, there's a lot more pages which you can tell details of the story. So either see that, you know, read the book first or the documentary first, either way. Uh, I think it'll inspire you to check out the other one. <laughs> Very good. Well, hey, thank you, Ron, and thank you to everybody for uh, joining us tonight. Again, don't forget to click that like, subscribe, or follow button so we can let you know about uh, future shows. As always, if you have an idea for a topic you'd like to hear more about, just send Leah Block an email at media at cifhq.org. And uh, again, thanks to uh, Ron King for joining us uh, tonight. And thank you for, uh, for sticking with us and uh, being part of our uh, audience for WarbirdTube. And until next time, I'm Steve Buss. Have a great night.